So this will be the second talk in the series that we've been doing on the precepts. Uh, Rev. Master Ando did a um, really nice introduction. It's already posted on the um, website. Um, and she started going through the Kyoju Kaimon and she got as far as going over Sange, Contrition and Conversion, and the, th and the three refuges. We've got a lot of people coming in here. Let's get everyone in here. I wanted to start by saying a few things about the precepts in general. Um, in Soto Zen we have 16 precepts. The Buddha gave different teaching to different people at different times, at different places. And our precepts go back to the Buddha. Um, but it was Dogen who collected, collected them up in our uh, present arrangement that we use. Dogen's the founder of Soto Zen in Japan. I doubt, well, many of you probably don't have this as an issue, but um, there's no need to get worried about some traditions having more precepts or less precepts. Precepts are sort of like uh, your vehicle. You know, and we're all trying to get to the same place. We just come in, you know, have a vehicle of different model cars, and we all have cover the same territory and get to the same place. And it was Dogen that collected these up as the 16. Our precepts fall under the Mahayana branch of Buddhism. That was the branch that spread from northern India along the Silk Road to China, then to Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and now to the West. And when we talk about Mahayana, it's often translated as uh, the great vehicle. And it's not great in the sense of being better than another vehicle, but it's great in the sense of being large because in Mahayana Buddhism, we want to take everybody to the other shore. We're training for self and other. Uh, we start with self, and then we train for other, and eventually we just train for training's sake. But we do uh, train for other as well as self. And uh, as part of that, we have the Bodhisattva as our aspiration to emulate. Uh, uh, the Bodhisattva is a being set on enlightenment, but, but set on enlightenment for everyone. That's what makes one a Bodhisattva. And we're all aiming for full Buddhahood. But full Buddhahood means we take everyone with us. Um, our precepts are off also called the precepts of Buddha nature because they not only give us a prescription for how to act but they are also a description of how a Buddha acts and how a Buddha lives how a Buddha thinks okay so that we they may, we may start using them as a moral code but they quickly you begin to discover that they describe enlightened action we want to know how we're doing, we can observe and reflect on our actions in the light of the precepts. And the sense is that we all already are Buddha. We all already have the Buddha nature and we're living from the Buddha nature. And that's why they're called the precepts of Buddha nature.
there was um, a time uh, when the Buddha was talking to his monks and he held up a handful of leaves and said, what, you know, disciples are, the, you know, which is greater, the leaves in my hand or the, all the leave, leaves in the jungle, in the forest? And of course they said, well, of course, there's much, many, many more leaves in the forest than you have in your hand. And the Buddha said, yes, that is so, but in what I teach is what I hold in my hand. Uh, what I know is as the leaves in the forest. But I teach only two things, suffering and the end of suffering. And the precepts help us with that. They're part of that handful of leaves that are so important. Um, uh, that they describe suffering, you know, our, our dissatisfaction, our unease, and the end of suffering. And then that, that tr dyad gets expanded to the Four Noble Truths. It, we look for the cause of suffering. Um, and then we also look at how we practice the path, how, do we, how we practice getting to the end of suffering. And the precepts are really critical for doing that. The precepts give us insight into the law of karma. You know, s simply put, what goes around comes around. That's already kind of in our kind of everyday consciousness, I think, in this country. I, I ran across it in, in a book, in a, a mystery novel, I think. <laughs> You know, written 10 years ago. So it seems that have already percolated in our society that we have all have a general sense of our actions have consequences. And those consequences are the, are the uh, direct result of our actions. And so we can study our present life and perhaps get some insight into why things are the way they are now because because of some things that we have done in the past and what we do now is going to shape the future. Now this is not fate and it's um, the Buddha uh, he tweaked the what we call the law of karma. Law of karma was already well known in his day in India but he tweaked it in based on his own insight, that it's the intention behind the action that uh, makes for the e effect. And we have this in our, uh, in our um, um, in our, in our laws in regarding to killing of other people. We have first degree murder where there's the intention, there's premeditated, premeditation before it. Okay, then there's second degree, which is, um, I believe, killing someone in def self-defense. Then you have manslaughter, you know, which is killing someone by accident. In all three cases, you end up, you have someone who's dead and you have someone who's killed them. But the consequences are different depending upon the intention uh, behind the person who did the killing. Um, it's also the case that we can, it, it, karma does not work like tit for tat, um, or an eye for an eye, or because what you do now shapes your karma from the past, and it may uh, manifest differently than the exact action that you performed in the past. You know, for instance, they often say that people who are um, sick a lot, uh, often they, if, if they've been practicing, you know, and it, they, uh, they're reaping the karmic consequences from past killing. Uh, if they hadn't been practicing, they probably would have ended up with, you know, being killed in this life. Uh, but because they've been practicing and that affects the karmic stream, they end up just, you know, being sick a lot. 
Okay, so um, there's a number of ways that you know karma manifests, and it's it's complex. I'm not going to pretend that it's easy. And he said only a Buddha can understand it fully, uh, but I, it's enough for us to know that what we do have consequences, and the precepts show us how to live in such a way that we create as few negative consequences as possible. Okay, now let's turn to the uh, Kyoju Kaiman. The Kyoju Kaiman is a short little work that Dogen wrote on the precepts. I'm going to be, uh, a lot of this talk will just be reading some commentaries and I'll be taking them from Serene Reflection Meditation, this book. Um, this is on the Trast Abbey website, publications. It's, well, it's a free PDF. It's also um, a Lulu book. You can find it on Lulu if you want to have a printed copy. The two commentaries I'm going to read from, or well, one is by Reverend Master Daisui, who succeeded, succeeded Reverend Master G as the head of our order. So he served as the head of our order from 1996 to 2003 when he died. Um, and then I'll also be reading from Reverend Master Jiyu's commentary on the uh, Kyoju Kaiman, which she gave, uh, which she wrote down in 1976 as part of her, uh, you know, the big retreat and uh, opening experience that she had at that time. So as I said earlier, we've got 16 precepts in Soto Zen. Um, they come in sets. The first set is the three refuges. Okay. The second set are the three pure precepts, which is what we're going to talk about today. And then following that, there are the ten great precepts. And then beyond that, there's other, you know, there's the 48 less grave, you know, there's all the different precepts in the Vinaya. Uh, but we're going to focus today on the three pure precepts. And they're quite simple. Um, there, there's a, a story of um, a monk, someone asking a monk for uh, the, to distill the teaching down to uh, the simplest form. And the Buddha said, okay, yes, cease from evil, do only good, purify your heart. And uh, in Mahayana, it, it shifts just a little bit because in addition to purifying our heart, that precept is expressed as do good for others. So cease from evil, do only good, do good for others. And the person who, um, who asked the question told the Buddha, well, even a child knows that, you know, this is a very profound. And the Buddha said, well, maybe even a, a child can understand it, but even a person of 80 sometimes doesn't know how to practice it. Okay, so it can seem simple, but it's actually pretty uh, inclusive. And these, these precepts are sometimes called the three collective precepts, because all the precepts can be collected up in this one basket of the three pure precepts. And then the three pure precepts serve as uh, guidance when there seems to be a conflict between two of the other precepts, like the ten precepts, or if you're facing a situation where the ten precepts just don't apply, you know, what do you do? Well, you have the three pure precepts that you can run an action through, reflecting, you know, is this, is this ceasing from evil? Is this doing harm? Okay. Um, is it doing only good? Is it appropriate for the present situation? And then next, does it do good for other others? Okay, getting the, the focus off of ourselves and considering the consequences for other other beings. So I'll start with Reverend Master Daisui's commentary. Uh, 
I will cease from evil. First and foremost, it is my wish to harm no living thing. I will ask in the innermost place of my heart, is what I am about to do a harmful thing, a thing which places any separation between a being and the unborn? Is it a thing which is to be abstained from, a wrongful thing, an unwise thing? In one sense, evil does not exist. There are only unwise actions done in ignorance and confusion. I pray that I may not do any such thing, whether to myself, others, or the world. And then looking at Reverend Master Chu's commentary, Again, she's um, commenting, commenting on the Kyoju Kaiman, which Dogen wrote. So I'll try to indicate which parts are Dogen and which parts are Reverend Master Jiyu. Uh, this is Dogen speaking here. Cease from evil. This is the house of all the laws of Buddha. This is the source of all the laws of Buddha. And then Reverend Master Jiyu comments. The law of karma is one of the five laws of the universe. It is absolute, it is inescapable. All are bound by the law of karma once it is set in motion. By accident, someone made the course of karma. It is not intentionally set in motion. What happens or happened or will happen to you or to anyone else is caused by karma. Now I'll just insert here now she's also said that there's law of karma is, is just one of five laws of the universe. So sometimes things happen to us that aren't necessarily karma. They just are the consequence of living in a human body. We get sick. You know, we, uh, we end up in a car accident. There's a tornado or a hurricane. Okay. We don't need, we don't ascribe uh, natural disasters to the law of karma. By accident, the wheel rolled the wrong way. Do not continue the rolling of the wheel in the wrong direction by dwelling on the past or fearing the future. Live now without evil. Stop the wheel now by cutting the roots of karma, by knowing the house builder of the house of ego. If you do not, karma will go on endlessly. Cease from evil is absolute in thought, in word, in deed, in body, in spirit. All are bound by the law of karma. Do not doubt this. You will pay for everything you do if you do not cut the roots now and live by fully digested perceptual truth. Do not worry about the karma of others. Each man his karma makes. And again, it, where she's saying you will pay for everything you do. Keep in mind what I just said about it's not tit for tat or an eye for an eye. Uh, there's some karmic consequence to everything that we do, but there's also sometimes there's neutral karmic consequence. Not everything falls into good or bad. You know, but the decision you make about buying which kind of toothpaste is, isn't probably a moral dilemma. You know, it probably isn't going to have, you know, moral repercussions down the, down the line. Um, the other thing I think that's important in here is where she says, do not worry about the karma of others. Each man his karma makes. Um, she, she's also, she often would quote Dogen uh, saying, uh, the Thinking the Dharma is for somebody else is the most useless of all useless opinions. Okay. Okay. So we, but we train for ourselves without making judgments about other people's training, about other people's lives. Um, there are times when we have to practice our discernment if we're involved with another person or say in a political election or uh, we're, um, on a city council, um, we're uh, go 
going over someone's job interview. Um, we don't give up our wise discernment. In fact, what happens is our delusion turns into wisdom. The three poisons, which are greed, hate, and delusion, sometimes delusions uh, describe as ignorance. Um, our ignorance, our delusion, turns into wisdom through our practice. Okay, and anyone who's practiced for a while can look at their lives and see, oh, you know, my life isn't as bad as it used to be. Uh, I've got a lot more clarity about what's right and wrong and what's good to do and what's not good to do. That's your that's your wisdom manifesting itself. Okay. Wise discernment. We don't give that up. And we also um, don't give up our common sense. You know, we keep the precepts and the, and the precepts um, will guide us They'll guide us, but it's assumed that um, you're also using your, you know, as I used to hear it growing up, the brain God gave you. <laughs> you know, you know, you, we use our minds. Okay, so that's the first of the three pure precepts. The second one is uh, do good, do only good. And here's Reverend Master Dysley on this. I will do only good. It is my sincere wish to do only that which accords with the truth. I will ask in the innermost place of my heart, is what I am about to do fitting, suitable, a thing to be done? Does it tend towards liberation? This is a good that goes beyond the opposites of good and evil. And it's through our meditation that we can know this stillness that gives us guidance uh, when we reflect on our actions and um, particularly if we're thinking about doing something. Um, we try to be as still as possible and ask, what's good to do here? Now turning to the Kyoju Kaiman, Dogen writes, do only good. The Dharma of Shakyamuni Buddha's enlightenment is the Dharma of all existence. Okay, this is Reverend Master commenting. Do not do anything unless it is good. Again, kind of good in quotation marks. Do not do anything unless you have first asked the Lord of the house if it is good for you to do it. The Lord of the house is another way of describing the eternal, or the unborn. Uh, Kazan uses it a lot. It's, it sounds for, I think for a lot of us it has kind of Christian connotations, but it's, it's not, it's very Buddhist. Um, um, I think one translation I saw, if, I'm, if I understood it correctly, described it as the old man in the, in the castle, <laughs> okay? And if you think of, um, uh, the feudal state in Japan, everything had to accord with what the feudal lord in the castle said. Your life was on the line. Okay, So lord of the house is just another way of talking about that which we consider to be most important. Okay, Do nothing whatsoever in a hurry. Do nothing whatsoever on the spur of the moment unless you know the certainty given by the Lord of the house. Know that you must take the consequences of what you do if it is not a fully digested act, for you know what lies beyond good and evil, right and wrong. You know that which lies beyond morality. You know the Lord of the house. Okay. We all know in our heart uh, what is good to do. Now, sometimes it's murky. Sometimes we don't 
uh, understand. And we have to act uh, in the midst of less than perfect understanding. But that's how we learn, okay? We don't stop acting, waiting for ourselves to get enlightened. <laughs> okay, otherwise it would be, probably most of us would be a long time before we could do anything, okay? Um, it said, you know, good, ex um, good judgment is based on experience and experience is based on poor judgment, okay? It's only by doing that we learn. And Reverend Master G used to say she couldn't teach someone who wasn't afraid to make a mistake, okay? We have to be spiritual adults, make the best decision we can, be open to studying the consequences of what happened, and learn from them, okay? Rev. Master G goes on, I'm not gonna read any more because you can study this for yourself. Um, but she talks about listening to the Lord of the house, not confusing the Lord of the house with oneself. Okay, we're all working on letting go of self. And the importance of trying to say, when we hear that still small voice, the importance of saying yes. As she says, uh, spring up joyfully to answer. Okay. Um, when it says no, we must try not to disobey that teaching. And she ends that section with, know that the Lord of the house will never break the precepts. Okay, that's our insurance um, for studying with anyone. Uh, a good teacher is not gonna ask you to break the precepts. If they're asking you to break the precepts, it means you've, you've misunderstood the request or the person isn't a real really good teacher you know so we have that as our our guard that the Lord of the house is not going to break the precepts that's why the precepts are so important if if we hear some something inside telling us to jump off a cliff we can be certain that that's not the Lord of the house that's telling us that because the Lord of the house would not harm itself. The Lord of the house is not separate from anything and everything else. Why would it harm itself? Okay. Now, the third pure precepts, do good for others or purify your heart. Here's how Reverend Master dies. We commented on that. I will do good for others. I pray that my every act will be of true benefit and that I may in it never inadvertently create conditions which may lead others to do harm. I will ask in the innermost place of my heart is what I'm about to do truly of use? Is it a fit offering? Does it accord with the purification of my heart? And then turning to Reverend Master Jew's commentary. Do good for others. This is Dogen. Do good for others. Be beyond both the holy and the unholy. Let us rescue ourselves and others. Okay, Dogen's pointing us to the still small voice, that which is beyond both holy and unholy. I think lay ministers have that inscribed on the, uh, the insides of your rock suits, your small uh, casas. I think there's, um, there's a quote from Reverend Master Jiu about the eternal being um, beyond the holy and the unholy. So Reverend Master comments, do not set up a chain of causation that will cause others to do wrong. Do not do that which will cause another to grieve. Do not do that which will result in your creating karma for the another being. Do not accidentally set the wheel of karma in motion. You know, none of us sets the wheel of karma in motion um, 
put this. Um, there's very few few people who are actually very, really evil. Okay, and, uh, often we talk about evil as being someone who delights in evil. There's very few people who delight in evil. Most people just make their uh, karma from being ignorant or being confused, not knowing any better. Um, uh, there's, um, um, and that's one of the ways that we can foster compassion when we look at the actions of others we can reflect on the fact that if they knew better, they really would do better because they will reap the consequences of what they do. So the Master Ji continues, before any act is performed, you must ask yourself, am I ceasing from evil in doing this act? Is it good in the sight of the Lord of the house? Shall I cause another being to do harm, either to himself or to others? I cannot stop him doing harm, for each man his karma makes and must carry for himself. But I can do that about myself, which will prevent me from accidentally starting the course of karma. I must think carefully of my every act. I may not cause another to make a mistake in Buddhism. By so doing, we rescue both ourselves and others, for in cutting the roots of karma for ourselves, we help to cut the roots of karma for others also. And then she completes this um, with saying, these three are called the three pure precepts. Without them, one cannot live the Buddhist life. And traditionally, in uh, the Buddhist tradition, it is in accepting the precepts in a formal way is um, uh, the way that we formally become Buddhists. Okay, it's acceptance of the precepts. Where Master Daisui, turning him, he, how he sums up the three pure precepts, he says, If we can honestly say that in any matter of importance we have considered carefully these three pure precepts, then we can rest in the knowledge that we have done our best. He's making the point that we don't have to be perfect. Okay. And that is all which Buddhism ever asks of us. Mistakes will still be made, of course, for we are human, but they will have been made with a pure heart, and in the big perspective, that matters. There are many ways to consult the quiet, still, innermost place of the heart. Each of us must do this honestly, as best we can. There are no formulas, no easy answers. Never trivialize the three pure precepts. And that comes back to what I said in the uh, in opening discussion of, on the three pure precepts. So even a child, you know, knows the three pure precepts, but um, a person of many years may not know how to practice them. Don't trivial, you know, don't because they're simple. Don't trivialize them. <laughs>